Committee of the Board of Education. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making, a, making and seconding a motion as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. As a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Mr. Edwards or Ms. Barr if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Mr. Edwards, please call the roll to determine a presence of the quorum of the committee. Thank you. Ms. Booker Dwyer. Present. Ms. Frempong. Present. Harvey. Mr. McMillian. Mr. McMillian. We can't hear you, Mr. McMillian. Yes, but I, I see you there. I can't hear okay. you, but I see you. Mr. Young. Present. Thank you. A quorum is present. Mr. Edwards, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you. Ms. Barr? Present. Ms. Stevens? Present. Mr. Fletcher? Present. Ms. Manna? Present. Ms. Jamison? Here. Sample? Here. Mr. Strait? Here. Ms. Crew? Present. Ms. Smith? Present. Mr. Hardlaw? Here. Mr. Corns? Present. Dr. Wheeler? Ms. Callanan? Present. Ms. Poor. Ms. Dawkins. Present. Ms. Shanahan. Mr. Stovenauer. Present. Mr. Fort. Ms. Lambert. Ms. Mustafer. Ms. Hunton. Present. Mr. Hodge. Present. Dr. Jones. Dr. Grimm. Mr. McCall. Present. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to also request if, if there's any other staff members participating that I haven't uh, mentioned, please uh, state your name now. Mary Shanahan's on. Good afternoon. This is Robin Harvey, a board member. I'm, I'm in attendance now. Okay, thank you. Uh, turn it back over to Ms. Booker Dwyer. All right, thank you, Mr. Edwards. And so I am excited to kick off this season of audit committee meetings. Um, the audit committee, it is truly an essential committee for the school system. Ms. Barr and her team, they work hard to ensure that the school system is adhering to the established protocols, policies, and procedures. And as a board, we truly, truly value the work of the audit team um, led by Ms. Barr. Uh, the purpose for the meeting today is we want to start off by setting the foundation for the future, for our future work. 
So what you're going to see in the first part of the agenda is we are going to review and reflect on what has occurred previously, and we're going to use those lessons learned to inform our continuous improvement. And so what you're going to, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, start by setting the stage for the future. And that's going to require us to kind of review some previous documents and, and look at the full calendar for the year. And the reason why we have this calendar for the year is that, number one, we want to be totally transparent with the public um, with uh, what they can expect when they come to an audit or when they tune into an audit committee meeting. And then it also helps us as a board to prepare and to ensure that we are meeting the mark um, and the deliverables that are required as stated in our policy. So Ms. Barr and her team, they work very hard creating this calendar. Um, and it is, and as a board, as a committee, we're going to discuss it. Mm -hmm. Um, we can make recommendations and um, and move forward with it. So if there are any questions or anything that are outside of what's on the agenda today or that's outside of what's being presented, um, please put them in the chat or let us know. And what we'll do is we'll either um, add it as a future agenda item or we will get back to you with mm -hmm. that question. And so um, I am going to turn it over to Ms. Barr to uh to start with the to begin with our first topic uh thank you good afternoon appreciate the opportunity to present the office of internal audit fy24 quarter four for our year-end update miss manna could you please um display the report <clears throat> Thank you. So each fiscal year, we design our work plan to be ambitious and include more projects than we can complete due to the unknown number of carryover projects, unplanned projects, and number of investigations that we will need to complete each year. However, that is the significance of a risk-based plan as it allows for flexibility and the opportunity to address emerging risks or areas of concern for the board and the superintendent and to shift priorities that were initially identified at the time of the completion of the annual risk assessment. Nevertheless, in addition to the nine carryover projects, we included 24 new projects in our FY24 work plan. FY24 was a busy year for the office as we completed nine carryover risk-based audits, nine new risk-based audits, four unplanned projects, and 68 investigations. Of the 22 completed audit projects, eight were considered to be high risk, six medium, and four low risk. There were eight high risk and two medium risk audits that were deferred, primarily because the areas were already audited by external agencies with minor or no findings, or due to a rationale provided by the superintendent that was supported in writing and approved by the audit committee. Ms. Manna, can you please scroll to the issue tracking section of the report? At back to school night. But the basic was going to be, you know, just. Although we had six audits with no findings, we also monitored the status of management's corrective action plans related to findings noted in our audits. We were able to actually close seven projects as management completed all noted corrected actions satisfactorily. The 15 projects that remain open had anticipated completion dates beyond the end of fiscal year 24. And I, I forgot to mention all of these um, documents are included on on board docs if anybody's having a hard time reading it on the screen. And Ms. Mana, if you could now please scroll back up to the um, client survey results. I think it's important for the committee to know that for each audit that we complete, we send an audit client survey with 10 brief questions. You can see them here on the screen that seeks information about how well we communicated and interacted with the auditee. And I'm pleased to report that we received 19 out of 20 responses and that the survey results are most positive as reflected. And you can see in the survey answers and the written comments. These survey responses reflect positive results related to audit objectives, communication, timeliness, human relations, and value added. Um, this bar, could, um, just for one second. So if um, you're not speaking, could you mute yourself? Because we're hearing some background noise. And I just want to make sure that no one is, is on a hot mic. So um, if you're not speaking, if you could just please mute yourself so that we don't hear the background noise.
Thank you, Ms. Barr. You can keep going. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Ms. Maddox, can you scroll back up? I just want the um, committee to see the, the percentages. And as you can see, the, the favorable uh, results with the strongly agree and agree related to the uh, questions that were submitted to the auditees. And then again, if if you want to take a few minutes to read, scroll down, Ms. Mann, uh, you know, a couple of the comments uh, related to curriculum audits, um, school safety measures. We had um, um, special education, law office audit, purchasing audit, uh, gifted and talented, and uh, um, uh, school activity fund audit facilities, facilities, construction. So in, in some instances, it really did cause folks to take a look at uh, the processes that they were using and uh, improve on that and uh, revamp or uh, redo some of their SOPs or even create SOPs. So I, I felt that was important for the committee to be aware that we did receive positive feedback. Um, I will now turn it over to Mr. Fletcher for the, his FY24 year end investigations update. And then when he's completed his uh, presentation, we would open it up for any committee member questions or comments about the FY24 year end updates. Mr. Fletcher. Thank you, Ms. Barr. And as Ms. Barr mentioned, this document is on board docs as well. Um, this is the uh, Office of Internal Audit Investigative Unit year-end report uh, for FY24. <clears throat> and so I will start, I apologize, I'll start down here on table one. Uh, we'll start here on table one and throughout FY24, we received a total of 150 cases. This table summarizes those cases, which show that 75 were kept for investigation by internal audit. And that's what you'll see here. Everything. Here's what was kept for internal audit. 58 were provided to BCPS management. You'll see here on the second line. Uh, that's provided to them for their review and disposition. And then 17 were closed without investigation as the information provided was not in the purview of the hotline. Now, this table also shows that for the 75 cases kept for investigation by internal audit, 23 were misuse related to the misuse of company property or resources. 23 were payroll fraud or overtime abuse. Eight were conflict of interest. Eight were falsification of records. Six were theft. And three were related to, were related to procurement or purchasing practices. Now, the remaining four were either information seeking or no allegation was made. And as we move on to table two, slide down here for us. We note that in addition to the 150 new cases that were received during fiscal year 24, 32 cases remained open from the previous fiscal year, resulting in 182 cases that were open at some point during the fiscal year. Now, 167 of those 182 cases were closed during this fiscal year, resulting in 15 cases that were still open as of June 30th, 2024. And that's what you see here on this bottom line. Now, for the Office of Internal Audit Investigations, which are here in this first column, as I'm moving my cursor through, <clears throat> we noted that 96 were open throughout the entire fiscal year, and 81 were closed, resulting in the 15 that were still open as of the end of the fiscal year. Now, details related to those cases are available below on table three, which are on pages four and six, further down in this report. For the management investigations, which are here in column two, in the second column, 65 were open throughout the fiscal year, and all 65 have been closed. Details for those cases are available on table four, which is on pages seven and eight below. And then lastly, for cases that are outside the purview of the hotline, here in this final column, 21 were open throughout the fiscal year and all 21 have been closed. Details related to those cases are available in table five, which is on page nine below. Now, as I scroll through, these are the tables uh, that we mentioned before and you can see the, the um, level of detail that, that we do provide for them. One thing that I do want to point out is once we get through these tables, down here at the bottom, 
You'll notice that in addition, we have also included data visualization charts that will provide additional information related to the types of cases that come in through our hotline. And the first set of charts looks at the allegation classification for each of the cases, I'm sorry, for each cases that our office investigates. And it is important to point out that both the one year and three year data, scroll down just a little bit more, both the one year and three year data, more than half, approximately 55 to 62% of our cases are related to either the misuse of company property or resources or payroll fraud and overtime abuse. And as we scroll down to the second set, uh, our second set of charts looks at the substantiation rates for the cases that our office investigates. And here it is important. I'll scroll down a little bit. So up top, we have just FY24. Then on the bottom, we have our three-year analysis, FY22 through 24. Here it's important to point out that both the one-year and three-year data reflect that approximately 39 to 46% of our cases are substantiated and approximately 21 to 29% of our cases are unsubstantiated. And Ms. Barr, with that, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. We're now available to receive any comments or questions from the committee, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Any committee member have questions? Uh, good afternoon. This is uh, Mrs. Harvey. I, I just have a, a point of clarification or a question to clarify. Yes, please go. Please, go, please proceed, Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, of the 75 cases that you kept that came through the hotline, were these cases that were allegations of uh, individual conduct or misconduct or systemic uh, issues? Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Um, so that's actually a fantastic question. And it's it to be honest, it, it can be both. Uh, typically, it is individual, but as we conduct our investigations, what we typically find out is that there are systemic issues related to that uh, or, or related to the, the individual behavior, if you will. Uh, and so we, we do see both, but typically the, the specific allegation will be about an individual uh, doing a certain um, action, if you will. Thank you. That is helpful. Just to follow up. Uh, if how do you determine which individual cases are forwarded to human resources or personnel through BCPS and which ones are uh, remain with you for auditing? Sure. And that's a, a, another fantastic question. So we actually have a triage process. Uh, so when allegations come in through our hotline, uh, we'll we'll review them Um Typically, we'll review them individually, then we'll get together as a team and then make that uh, decision. But typically within our office, we're going to keep allegations that relate to fraud, waste, and abuse. And so I'm actually going to reshare very quickly this part of our, um, our update report. And you'll notice these are the common allegations that we're going to, uh, to keep and review as part of our uh, or within our office. And so we're looking at conflict of interest, falsification of records, um, really anything that takes us back to fraud, waste, or abuse. Uh, and then in terms of what it is that we will refer um, or, or send to management, we, those are going to be, um, I hate to just use the same term of fraud, waste, and abuse, but it's going to be outside of fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, we receive a lot of of things like um, interpersonal issues between staff members, between student and staff, between parents and staff, uh, things like that. Those are items that we would not keep uh, and investigate, and that would go um, to the superintendent's office. I hope did I hope that answered you clear enough. I'm sorry. It does. I, okay. I was just considering uh, because uh, we have the carryover. Um, if those cases would be cases that because they involve individual staff and individual staff conduct, uh, why they wouldn't go to uh, 
HR for investigation. Uh, so I appreciate your explanation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other committee member questions? So I do have um, just some follow up questions along the lines that Ms. Harvey was was asking, because when I look at HR, their um, investigations unit and they conduct abuse, neglect, like I'm just worried about duplication of, of efforts and who's really what is the best organization or what is the best office to handle certain things. I'm a I'm a little concerned with um way the way that it's explained, it appears that the lines are a little blurred. And so could you clarify it for me? Um that okay, so the audit, you are looking at this, and then HR, when there's in some for an individual employee, they are looking at this. Like I I'm still not quite clear because when I look at the policy and then when I look at the description of what HR does, it just it feels like there there may be some overlap. And so if you could just clarify it for me. Um, no, certainly. Difference. And 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 I hate I do not want to speak for uh, uh, our folks in HR. I know there are some folks here that that may want to chime in as well because uh, they certainly send uh, um uh, allegations for us to investigate to us, and we do the same with them. Um, but again, it, it goes back to the fraud, waste, and abuse uh, definitions uh, that are defined in policy. And so, and, and typically that is something that we can take when we're doing an investigation. Uh, it's we're really strictly looking at is this a violation of policy? Is the allegation what, what someone's being alleged of, of doing? Would that be? Um, uh, a violation of of board policy. Again, with what HR does, and I don't want to speak for them um, with them being in the room, but I, I think they're more of the uh, interpersonal. So if it's a person to person, this person did this to me, um, that's, that's where um, they become more involved, whereas we're looking at fraud, waste, or abuse committed against the school system, if you will. Okay. Thank you for that. Any other questions from board members? I'm um, from committee members. I'm sorry. This is Mrs. Harvey. I have uh, just another point of clarification. Uh, I, when I read the purpose of the audit uh, unit, and in, in in my experience with audits, is to determine. It's to help us to determine if there are systemic issues that are negatively impacting the system or positively impacting the system, what's working systemically, uh, where we may need to improve systemically. Uh, so is, is that a correct interpretation? That is part of what we do. That is what the um, risk based audits do. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Rumpong. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, I'm a very visual person in examples, just so I can have concreteness. So as Mr. Um, Fletcher was speaking about interpersonal relationships for HR and then audit, excuse me, the audit unit, <clears throat> for the fraud, waste, and abuse. So I guess if I, I just want to try to give an example to make sure I'm clear on, on what it is. So for example, Ms. Barr actually at a recent board meeting spoke about, for example, what if there was a science teacher who had misused um, the school funds? <clears throat> so while the funds may not have been a lot of money, that was one of the, it, it's a reputational risk. And so that's an example of, I guess, the audit um, committee because there's abuse there of a staff member against the system versus <clears throat> it goes to HR if same science teacher was just having issue with an administrator, another staff member, or even a student. So would that be, I guess, correct as far as my understanding? 
Ms. Frempong, I, th I think you're you're exactly on point, right? The your first example that that's actually theft, um, with the school system being the victim uh, in that that example, uh, as opposed to the other where it is truly a, a interpersonal issue, whether it needs some type of remediation or um, or if there's truly a a uh, defined conflict resolution set up for that automatically, that would be handled um, through a different type of investigation outside of our office. But the first part of your example would theft would be. Thank you. Any other questions? So I'm still I. I and so I'll just, in full transparency, I still, so if an employee is stealing something, that wouldn't go to HR? I, I think I'm in the mindset no. of Ms. Harvey with um, thinking about the bigger picture for the school system mm -hmm. and the, the bigger financial audits. But if that's not how this audit um, process is, is structured, um, and I don't know, that's just different from other organizations that... I'm aware that I've been a part of. I'll just say that. No, but you are correct that if if that were to come in through a hotline or if that were to come into HR or re be reported anywhere else, it would ultimately be funneled through to our office for us to investigate. Um, and, and we would take that investigation through to completion, depending on you know size, complexity, things like that. We certainly work with um, the Baltimore County Office of the State's Attorney um, to to take further actions if necessary, um, but that is something that would would go through our office. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions Absolutely. or comments before we move to the next topic? Okay, Ms. Barr, please proceed with the FY26 risk assessment process. Sure. So the first. Uh, uh, piece of information that we have to share. Uh, Ms. Manna, I don't know if you can bring up the work plan statistics from previous years, please. So this was uh, shared on board docs and this information provides work plan statistics such as planned, unplanned audits, carryover and deferred audits, as well as completed audits and investigations. Um, the information I think is pretty self-explanatory, so I would open it up to any committee member questions or comments regarding this information. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments from committee members? Okay, you can proceed. Ms. Barr. Sorry, I had to unmute. My apologies. So the next uh, piece of information that I provided is with the uh, risk assessment and work plan process. So we have a slide here that, that discusses our work plan development. And um, this information, again, is posted on board docs in accordance with policy 8400. I must uh, complete and present a, a risk based work plan with feedback from the board and executive leadership that the audit committee must approve no later than June 30th. And then additionally, in accordance with policy 8430, the board must approve our annual work plan. And ideally, this would occur prior to July 1st. So I will now open up to uh, any committee members' questions about the process or timeline that was provided in board docs. Any questions from committee members? Ms. Barr, you can proceed. Thank you. Uh, the next item that we have included in board docs is a, a FY25 provisional audit committee meeting topics calendar. One thing that I would like to point out is that these report presentations may be subject to change due to a variety of factors with, with um, perhaps delay in completion or earlier completion. So this is presented for uh, your review. And at this point in time, I will open up to any committee member question or comments about the provisional 
uh, timeline. Thank you. And Ms. Barr, could you just give a high level, or just walk us through a little bit, um, just in case uh, any committee member didn't have time to go deep in this, but just a high level overview of um, the rationale for the, the the logic behind the 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 setup for this calendar. Certainly. So there are certain um, times of the year where when we present uh, quarterly information with respect to our work plan um, and, and the risk assessment, and that is like I said, done quarterly. And then we also have to present the annual comprehensive financial report to the audit committee prior to the presentation to the board and also the single audit. Prior, well, that usually comes after the presentation to the board. And then there's a certain um, uh, period of time, as I mentioned, that we have to have the audit committee approve the work plan uh, no later than June 30th and, and ideally have the board approve it by July 1. So now this year we've actually uh, accelerated our, our risk assessment to have that done earlier and present the uh, proposed FY26 work plan to the committee in March. And then um, hopefully we'll have the approval of the work plan in April and then it would go to the board perhaps in, in May or June. The other thing is that as we get audits complete, we do present them to the audit committee and we request that management um, attends to, to uh, present their corrective action plan. And in some cases we have no findings, so we do present commendations related to the audits and it's nice for those folks to hear those commendations as well. Thank you, Ms. Frempong. Thank you. So with um, I think in the previous slide, as it talked about the work plan development, it said that it was done <clears throat> from December through February and then the work plan approvals were March through June. Um, I guess as far as the feedback, if there is input. Um, area um, that a member may feel needs to be included, what is the time frame then? Um, that that should be made known because, um, okay, yes, on that slide. Yeah, so at what point would you want that input? Just to make sure again, right, that there is enough time for um, your group to review, assess, and, you know, do all the risk analysis that it would do to determine whether or not should actually be part of the upcoming um, years. Okay. Work plan, thank you, or if it'll be a subsequent year. Yes. So right now we're in the process of uh, finalizing some staff development and conducting research related to risk assessment and preparing surveys for the board. I actually have a draft survey for the board members. Uh, we'll prepare surveys for this uh, superintendent and her executive level management, and we'll conduct those surveys during the month of October, and then we'll finalize those results. And then as a result of the finalization of the surveys, if we need to, we'll, we'll follow through and conduct interviews and begin reviewing and assessing the data in October. In November, we will continue to conduct interviews as needed and finalize those interview results, continue to review and assess data, and in November, um, uh, determine a, a, a work plan format if we still need to conduct interviews, that would be done um, th through December, finalize our risk assessment in December, and, and at that point in time, determine our work plan content. In uh, January, if there's a little bit uh, more time that we need to finalize the risk assessment, we'll do that and determine the work plan content. So there's a little bit of overlap. It could be done as early as December, but it, we might have to finalize it at, in the beginning of January. And then we want to complete the um, the work plan and present a draft to the superintendent uh, in February and adjust the work plan at that point in time if needed. If there's any additional feedback uh, in addition to what she provided in the survey response, finalize the draft work plan and get it to the audit committee in March. So then we, we theoretically would have uh, March, April, and May for audit committee um, review and, and approval. Great, thank you. You're welcome. 
Any other questions? And so I do have a question about the topics calendar. So I see in January, there's the early childhood, preschool and pre-K programs and curriculum. Could mm -hmm. you provide a little bit more insight as far as what's being audited for that? Uh, Ms. Banner, do you have the work plan up? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. Uh, Ms. Booker yes. Dwyer. Thank sorry. you. Hold on one moment. I'm sorry, it's the wrong. It's right here. So it's item number four. And the tentative objective, as you'll see, is to determine um, if our process, and again, we're looking at processes to expand pre K and preschool programs, are aligned with the Maryland blueprint. And again, that's a, a tentative objective as we go through um, the information gathering process and we talk to the process owners. Um, we might get more information or they might present a concern to us different than what the tentative objective is. But right now, this this is what the proposal is um, for this project. And so for that particular one, so there's the accountability and implementation board that school systems have to report their progress to. And then they determine whether or not you are in alignment with the blueprint or not. And so. Would, would this be a redundant audit or how are you ensuring that whatever comes out of the accountability and implementation board that there's not conflicting messages? So what if BCPS says, you know, from this audit, it says, oh, we're on the right track. And then the AIB board says, oh, no, you're not. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's just what I, I'm wondering for, for this particular one, because I know anything with the blueprint. The, the state law says it's the accountability and implementation board's job to make sure that it's happening at the school system, to make sure the school systems are doing it. Mm -hmm. And so could you just speak to a little bit mm -hmm. about that to how so, um, so, it's in alignment? I'm sorry. So again, I mean, if there if there would be evidence or appearance that that we would be duplicating efforts of an external agency, whether it's it's um, the state board or whether it's uh, Clifton Larson Allen, the external auditors and so forth, then we would come back and, and make a decision as to whether or not we need to defer or perhaps replace this project with another project. So there would not be redundancy. We, we avoid that redundancy um, again, because if others are doing something that we had planned to do, uh, we would not want to duplicate efforts. And we try to avoid that up front. So, um, but again, we have not explored that. We're not intending to do that until later in the year. And if, if need be, then we would come back to the committee and say that this project would need to be deferred or any project if, if there's a need to defer it and present the reason or rationale why and get approval from the audit committee to defer that or remove that from the current year plan and then replace it with another uh, project that we identified that perhaps uh, would be uh, in FY26 and move that up. And so then just thinking about, um, as we're th thinking about the next plan for FY26, mm -hmm. if if this could proactively be done, so anything with the blueprint, there's you know state laws around it and the accountability for it, and so if that Correct. could be proactively addressed before we, so that things like this, I, I, did, I don't, this is something that I don't feel is needed in this plan at, at this time, unless we were looking at the, fi the, the fiscal piece or if there was something a little bit more, but just to determine if, if we're in alignment with the blueprint, there's accountability structures. And I just, I, I feel like the, the audit team, it could, could maximize the the time because you all have like not you did 98 audits or so last year and so um, we could proactively these things that we know are handled by external people just to um not include because i also have a question about the february 18th when the employee training and development national board certification and educators rising um could you talk a little bit about that one as well uh, can you break can you bring the plan back up miss Vanna?
OK, so again, you can see the tentative objective is to make sure that that um, these programs are effectively and equitably implemented and support teacher professional development. So again, the, the blueprint establishes the standards, the program standards. So we would be in this case be looking for compliance with the standards. Um, I know that MSDE was just out. Uh, uh, in FY24 in February or so, and they have not really um, identified um, audit procedures yet for this area. So I think we were the guinea pig, if I recall correctly, with respect to this. But we know that there are standards and it's as with any audit, if there are standards, if there are policy, if there are laws, if there are regulations, we want to make sure that um, the organization is compliant with uh, established standards or laws or rules. And so then with this, so it's just a determination to determine, are you implementing the standards or not? It's not a question of fidelity of implementation or or the quality of implementation. This is just to say, okay, yes, you've implemented the standards. Well, it's it's difficult to say without doing the information gathering and um, doing a little bit more work in interacting with um, the individuals who are in charge of this. But typically, it would just be to make sure that we are compliant compliant with whatever the standards are. Sometimes, so the, it, it, sometimes it could be related to exactly what you said, the fidelity and things of that nature. Things like that come out through the audit process. So that could be mentioned that, and that could end up being one of our uh, procedures in, in the audit. But with each audit that we do, we, we do what we call an ORCP and we identify the objective of the um, of the department, we identify the risks associated with the potential to not complete the stated objectives of of uh, the department. And then we identify procedures that would help us to um, uh, satisfy our objectives and make sure that we are mitigating the risks if possible. So we do that for every single audit. And so then is an will an expert be brought in on the national board standards or with educator rising to determine compliance? Like or is compliance determined more so by the self-assessment of the people implementing the program? We would look at what the standards, program standards are. We would look at any associated laws um, with the uh, uh, National Board Certification, NBC. And I know there there are um, practices right now established with if, if they meet this requirement, then they get paid uh, $10,000. If they uh, meet certain requirements and they are in a, a, a school that requires um, or that is like a special school or has higher needs, then they get $17,000. So I know that that's part of, of what we would look at as well as far as an expert i would say that we have experts here in baltimore county public schools related to the national board certification in our um, hr and our um, organizational effectiveness de uh, departments in um, uh, miss snell and miss simons so we would work with those individuals um, in this project and so with that project, you would work with them to audit their office to determine if they are implemented, if it's being implemented effectively. Correct. And in compliance with whatever the program standards are. Is that. So uh, and I'm just thinking through this, because if if I'm the head of a department and now an audit is coming to me to see if what I'm rolling out and what I'm doing is correct, then if I'm going to say that I'm correct and I'm going to show you all the information to dim it. I, it, I don't know. It's 
I, I sometimes, sometimes they don't have they sometimes they don't retain the documentation required. Sometimes the documentation that we reviewed has errors in it um, there uh, or mistakes in it. I mean, the uh, MSDE audit results that we just got back identified uh, such errors. We get documentation, we get data, we get information, we have inquiry. It's a lot of different um, audit procedures that are applied when we conduct an audit. Now, and, I, and, and you know, uh, Ms. Booker Dwyer and committee members, all of our reports are posted on our website, so you would be able to see the nature of uh, the objectives and the audit conducted. Our scope and methodologies are identified in our audit reports um, as examples. Now, this is helpful. I appreciate the, uh, the clarity. I, I just want to ensure that, you know, when we think of Baltimore County Public Schools and just the, the historic decline for student achievement over the last few years. So I'm always looking at everything that we do, especially if it comes to anything with evaluative or, or audit, to ensure that, um, that the most effective practices are being used to ensure that you know, it's going to have that the intended results, the outcome for for our students. And so I know it seems like I'm asking a lot of questions. It just I, that was always my questions when I every time um, I would review an audit report, I just felt like if if I'm being audited about my work, mm -hmm. um, is that truly a, an unbiased audit if I'm telling you that, yeah, I, this is what I'm doing? And there's not truly that third party expert to say, OK, we see what you're doing and this is how the standard was intended to be implemented. But now you're implementing it this way and to improve, then this these are some suggestions or this is where you need to improve. So if it's more so. So I, I totally understand what you're saying, Ms. Barr, and I'm not trying to I, I do appreciate the work of your um, you and your team. I just want to ensure that. Anything that we we're doing that's an audit or that's evaluative is. Um, is truly going to inform the continuous improvement of the school system. Um, that that's all. But those are all and, of my and, questions I had. So this is this has been helpful, and that's our goal as well. Yeah. So that's why you know we are we are taking um, more staff development related to risk assessment. We are developing um, new surveys, uh, requesting feedback and input from executive level management and the board and and the committee. Um, so as we grow in using this process and we're refining our process um, and, and just so that you're aware also if we we do reach out to uh, subject matter experts, for example, MSDE, if we need to um, Office of Inspector General, I have a, a very good network with uh, my colleagues throughout the, uh, the state of Maryland, even even in the nation, we you know we work with um, other states as well just to see what they're doing. Um, so if we have to, we do do that. But I but I do also know that there are um, excellent experts in Baltimore County Public Schools as well uh, related to their their subject matter. Yes, thank you. And mm -hmm. Mr. McMillian, I see you came off. Uh, you got a question. We can't hear you, Mr. McMillian. No, Mr. we still McMillian, can't hear you. It might be your uh, headphones. If you unplug your headphones, you might come back. No. Nope, Audio still... settings. I'm sorry. There, there I'm you sorry. go. There we you can go. hear you. Okay. Uh, it, it seems to me that it would, whenever you conduct a, a, an, an audit and you're going back to, you know, whoever the, the leader of is of that particular group that you're looking at or the questions you're asked, of course, you're going to be gathering information from them. And they're going to give you their point of view on whether they're, you know, and most people are going to say, yeah, we're doing it. We're doing it the right way. But my point is, Ms. Barr, how many years of experience just just with without just uh, in your department how many years of of audit experience does your department have or are we talking 40 50 60 70 years experience combined 
Just take a ballpark guess. Probably three times that amount. So a couple hundred, well, so my point is, you know, we've got the experts right here in front of us and, and, and maybe they're not experts on the particular topic, but they go about their work in such a broad general way through, you know, following the red book and those different, those different standards that I'm confident that, and the results that they come out with. And, and back to what Ms. Barr said too, about the experts in our system, you know, we've got them in our system. We've got them in that department. And she said that if we need, you know, outside assistance, then they're willing to go get outside assistance. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Manna, I see your hand is raised. Thank you, Ms. booker -Dryer. I was just going to add to support a little bit of what um, Mr. McMillian said, is that we do take the time to understand the process that we're looking at. And although we do gather in the information from the process owners in the area that we're auditing, we do confirm and verify all of the information. We request data, we take it on a sample basis and go back to the benchmarks to make sure that they are meeting them. So that's how we determine whether they truly are meeting what they say they're doing. We, um, sorry, I didn't have my thing open. <laughs> we do go back and verify and confirm what we're asking of them. Thank you for that clarification. Any other yes. questions or comments? Oh, Ms. Barr, and, and, I'm sorry. And quite, I mean, people are, are very um, honest with us uh, in providing us the information. And, and and sometimes, like I said, there are no findings. We had last year six, six audits that had no findings, um, some that had some minor findings, and some that had some serious findings. And I think, in general, folks are aware of what, what their strengths are and uh, areas that perhaps need some improvement. I think they know that. Um, and and the cooperation level of all those under audit ha has been excellent. So we're appreciative of that as well. And I think, again, if you look at the um, survey results, you'll see that they were highly favorable survey results. Um, and we got very good comments. So I think we are again, progressing and moving through this risk assessment process, refining this process. And we, I believe, share the same goal that we want the best for the students and the parents and the community and, and Baltimore County Public Schools. And the way that we do that is working together. So uh, uh, we appreciate the level of cooperation that we always receive from the folks that we do go out and audit. Thank you. Any other questions or comment before we move on to the next topic? Okay, so I will turn it over to Mr. Strait. Please proceed with the help desk audit report. All right, thank you. I'm going to share the screen here real quick. All right, um, good evening board members, staff and guests. Um, I will be presenting the, the audit for technology operations, the help desk and BCPS serve. Um, go down here. The purpose of this audit was to ensure that uh, technology operations, help desk and BCPS serve supports the technology needs of the students and staff. And uh, you'll be happy to hear um, that th we found no reportable findings uh, in this audit, based on the test work and all of our um, audit procedures that we performed, the uh, various procedures that we did perform on a sample basis, we did look at uh, help desk tickets, whether they come in. Actually, we did two samples of help desk tickets related to BCPS serve, which is the module and portal where end users can enter in their questions via the Internet in using their credentials and we also took a sample of the hotline phone calls so it was two separate samples that we we uh we looked in detail related to those um even though there was no reportable findings we did have uh six commendations that i would like to highlight and i would again like to thank the cooperation that um the staff provided with us and thank you mr corns and mr stovenauer for being on the call 
Um, but our six accommodations from this audit were um, related to communications, the access to technical support, um, documented standard operating procedures and processes, the monitoring that the office staff conduct over both processes related to the hotline phone calls and the BCPS serve tickets, the knowledge base, which is an area where they provide uh, frequently asked questions and other articles within the BCPS serve module that allows um, the opportunity for BCPS staff and students to get self help. Um, that's a that's a, that's a great feature of the the product that they provide to the customer base, i.e., students, staff, and also the other combination is the training that all staff go through um, throughout the year. Um, that's basically it. The the results again, no reportable findings. Um, this is the methodology that we used for the process and all the testing that we did. I'd like uh, to open the floor to Mr. Corns and Mr. Stovenauer if they would like anything to add anything additional to um, the presentation here. But beyond that, that's all I have. And any questions that you guys might have. Thank you. Any questions from committee members? Right. Thank you. Thank you. So we will. Oh, wait, Ms. From Pong has a question. I'm sorry. It was <clears throat> more of a of a statement. Um, personally, I know Mr. Corns has always been very helpful to me as a board member when trying to access things and dealing with technology. And so I wasn't surprised to see the good results. Um, from this report, so just wanted to, I guess, extend another um, commendation to Mr. Um, Corns and his team because even looking at the data, as far as closing tickets on um, first contact or um, the number of days that they are uh, making sure, on average, that tickets are resolved, and I think is um, pretty impressive. Um, so, just wanted to actually more so state that as another commendation for Mr. Corns and his team. Thank you. Yes, and they were a great help throughout this audit. And they do another thing I'd like to add that the their team they do track because they're in the customer service business for the staff and students, and they track their metrics. And that's what I tried to highlight with those graphs in this report. And again, this report is on board docs and on our internal audit website. But I really wanted to showcase their efforts to better their customer service every single year. And I tried to show a year to year snapshot of that work that they perform. Thank you. I will Mr. take that Corns. message back to team. <laughs> yes, we definitely appreciate all of your work, Mr. Corns and the team. Yeah, they are uh, they are much more skilled at this than I am, uh, Ms. Booker Dwyer. So uh, I will uh, make sure that they all receive this commendation. Um, we um, just as a as a, a note, we we work with audit quite a bit on um, both things that they need for other audits as well as auditing of the things that we're doing and uh, that we've always found it very beneficial for them to uh, bring to us our process improvements and uh, and it's uh, nice to have internally the ability to have someone look over our shoulder and make sure that our processes are being followed and so uh, I'm glad this one came out um, well and uh, we're going to keep striving for even better next year but thank you again. Thank you. Okay, we will uh, proceed with Ms. Smith and the Psychological Services Student Eligibility uh, Audit Report. And I didn't have my mic on, sorry about that. Okay, so I'm going to go over the audit psychological service. Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer and good afternoon board members, staff and guests. My name is Ashley Smith and I was the senior auditor on this project. 
So we just like to present our audit findings or, or audit results, I'm sorry, of the psychological services eligibility for students under Section 504 and IDEA audit. We first would just like to thank the OPS staff for being here today. I think I saw uh, Ms. Patricia Mustafer, the Director of Student Support Services. And I would also like to note that this is this audit report is posted on our website and is on board docs with tonight's meeting agenda if you'd like to review it in more detail. Our audit objective um, was to assess if the eligibility, the assessment and monitoring of students who receive psychological services complies with Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Section 504. The audit period we looked at was the school year of 23-24. So we did not um, identify any findings. And out of our audit, we came up, we found six commendations that we would like to just quickly share with you. So, um, for background, um, I just wanted to quickly, sorry, talk about that the OPS is part of the Department of Student Support Services under the Chief of Schools, and in accordance with their mission, the OPS determines student eligibility under IDEA and collaborate with the IEP team. Um, they determine student eligibility for disabilities under Section 504, and they collaborate in the development of 504 plans through student support teams. They administer psychological assessments using culturally and linguistically sensitive measures for students suspected of disabilities, and they provide professional development and training to school staff and parents and guardians. So um, the IDA and Section 504 are the set of guidelines that to support eligible children with disabilities, including psychological services to benefit from public education. And then for assessments, a psychological assessment is administered if the student is suspected of a disability. Through various models and methods, assessments are completed by psychologists using culturally and linguistically sensitive measures. And the Maryland State Department of Education requires psychologists performing these assessments to have a Maryland professional certificate with a school psychologist endorsement. And lastly, the process for this eligibility of psychological service is governed by BCPS policy and rule 5430, psychological services and positive behavior. Okay, sorry, now I'll go to the commendations. Um, first, we just wanna thank the Office of Psychological Services personnel with their prompt responses during the audit process. Dr. Wheeler, Ms. Mustafer, and Ms. Lambert were very helpful and very responsive, so we want to thank them. We also reviewed the, their SOPs and we confirmed the compliance with applicable federal and state guidelines and with policy rule 5430. For our sample, the eligibility criteria, criteria outlined within IDEA and section 504 was properly applied on evaluations performed for psychological services. Also, for our sample, all of the required documentation, including evaluation reports, meeting minutes, and communication with the parent or guardian was accurately maintained and retained within the student records. The student's IEP and 504 plans were monitored to ensure psychological services were being provided and adjustments were made when necessary. The assessments are completed by certified professionals who possess a Maryland professional certificate with a school psychologist endorsement. And additionally, we verified that the assessments were performed in accordance with IDEA and Section 504, and when applicable, that they were culturally and sensitive, culturally sensitive and appropriate for diverse student populations. So that's the report, and I would just like to turn it over to um, if anyone from the Office of Psychological Services would like to add anything. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you. Um, I'm Trish Mostafer, the Director of Student Support Services, and I have the privilege of having Dr. Aaron Wheeler with me this evening 
who's the coordinator of psychological services. And we just want to say thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we were very pleased with the findings and we continue, we look forward to continuing, continuing to grow our practice around the provision of services and always hope to meet the standard of excellence for Baltimore County. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions from committee members? So I just have a few questions. So as part of the audit process, did you review any state or federal reviews of implementation of IDEA in Baltimore County public schools for these specific services? Um, so we followed, let me get to that one part there, um, the regulations that we had listed here. So we looked at Comar for the school psychology program and their regulations. Um, and then in regards to Comar for confidentiality and consent uh, with the students' files. And then we also looked at the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and uh, board policy. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not the federal. And then the USC individuals, the IDEA Act. So those were the the regulations that we focused our audit testing within. Okay. And then um, as just a follow up, so you said that you determined that everything was culturally responsive. How was that determined? What could you so uh, we, provide some insight? Yep, sorry. that'll be helpful. <laughs> sorry. Um, so we actually um, did a survey on a uh, sample A of psychologists and we, um, Sorry, we did a sample on school psychologists that we asked for a universe of them for the school year. And then we um, sampled them by providing them with a um, survey and asking them what they do in, in regards to this. So they um, provided that they uh, um, receive trainings on this topic. They um, are provided with different, um, they have not only trainings, but they get together with it throughout the year um, to have um, if any regulations or any kind of standards are updated so that they're informed of them. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have it, the actual test or, or the actual survey in front of me, but that's kind of how we tested that by asking the psychologists themselves how they go about and performing their test um, in regards to that topic specifically. So. And I see Ms. Manna has her hand up and then I'm going to go to it. So I'll go to Ms. Manna and then Ms. Rimpong, I'll come to you. Sure, I just wanted to add and, and make sure and um, I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't put my camera on again. <laughs> that we did look through um, IDEA and five, Section 504 requirements for the eligibility for psych service. So, so we identified what what things have to be there. And we on, on our sample, we went through um, the online program S S P S P P to make sure that all of those components were there for the students that we sampled. And then like um, Ashley uh, explained, we looked at the training that's provided around the what's provided from central office to ensure that the um, assessments are culturally sensitive and diverse for diverse populations. And we asked them what what they in the survey, what they do to ensure that and we went back to what the requirements were to ensure that and for the population that are that sample that we looked at and that's how we determined whether they complied or not. Thank you, Ms. Brumfong. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so with this, um, with this audit, I guess there was the assumption or presumption that all children who needed those services had been identified, correct? Because this is a audit based on children that were identified. So there wasn't any, um, yeah, I guess there wasn't any kind of looking at have all the children who do need services been properly identified.
Um, I, so I think what you're asking is if we looked at if they were identifying all of the correct, like, is that what you're asking? Sorry. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. So in just in, in looking through this and 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 everything, I guess what I'm just trying to make sure I understand is like what was that population that you looked at? Because as I'm saying, it seems like this audit was done assuming that all the children who should be receiving services were indeed receiving services. I guess is that the presumption that was made? Or did they actually look to see if all the children that should be receiving services were receiving services? So our population was from all the students that were receiving services. And then as we tested and looked at through their file, we were making sure that they were receiving the appropriate services. So I think it's and kind of a little bit eligible. of both <laughs> that they were eligible for it. Right. Um, but so we started with that one list of all of them that are receiving them and then kind of making sure that they were receiving them appropriately and eligible for them appropriately. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah, so it, it does sound like then what you you went based on the children that had been identified, and then you were doing verifications against um, the children that were identified, but you worked off of a list of identified students then. That's correct, yes. Okay. Any other questions? All right, thank you. So we will move to the next audit report. Uh, Ms. Sample, please proceed with the criminal background checks process audit report. Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Good afternoon, committee members, staff, and all those attending this meeting. I am Sandy Sample, one of the senior auditors in the Office of Inter Internal Audit. We completed the criminal background check audit and issued the final report on September 5th, 2024. And the report can be found on board docs for this meeting and is posted to internal audits website. Um, I would like to thank Ms. Molly Callanan for being here to help address any possible questions. Okay, so I'll scroll down. And just to give you a little background, um, the Office of Investigations and Records Management is responsible for overseeing the fingerprinting and criminal background checks for all paid positions, um, including inside contractors, unpaid interns, and volunteers. And so the objective of this audit was to determine if, if the BCPS criminal background check process complies with regulations. And our audit period uh, was June 1st, 2023 through May 31st, 2024. And we determined that BCPS is compliant with applicable regulations and no, no issues were identified during this review. Um, we did identify five commendations, and I will briefly go through those. And it will also speak to uh, some of the work that we did as we performed this audit. So the first commendation is related to communication. We appreciate everyone we worked with for their cooperation. Uh, I worked with Ms. Melinda Basler and Ms. Maui Callanan for the majority of this audit. And we really appreciate their cooperation and prompt responses. The second commendation is related to criminal background checks. We reviewed applicable regulation and criminal background check requirements and compared that to what was being reviewed during criminal background checks. And we found that the scope of criminal background checks complies with applicable regulations and that all required elements were being reviewed with the criminal background checks. Um, for the next commendation, we wanted to ensure that individuals with adverse criminal background check results were not hired. And we found that the Office of 
investigations and records management reviewed and evaluated adverse information received. Um, for the next one, regarding current employees, we found that criminal background checks were performed for employees with a higher date of October 1st, 1986 or later. For the employees that we reviewed, no adverse criminal background information was identified and the results were properly recorded in the human resources computer systems. Um, those would be uh, CGI and also the onboarding system, which is Silk Road. Um, the last one that's listed here, the last commendation, we wanted to ensure that employees were not hired prior to the receipt and evaluation of criminal background checks results. And for the employees that we reviewed, we found that the results were reviewed prior to the employee being hired. Um, I, I do have a, a verbal commendation I'd like to add that is not in this report. And that is regarding the safeguarding of records. Ms. Melinda Basler required the audit team working on this audit to take security awareness training prior to our reviewing um, any of the records. <laughs> uh, that was to ensure that we understood our responsibility to protect and secure um, the criminal justice information that we were being provided during the audit. And so I, I wanted to indicate that one additional verbal commendation. That is all for this report. I'd like to thank Ms. Melinda Basler and Ms. Molly Callanan for their cooperation during this audit. And Ms. Booker Dwyer, I will turn it back over to you for any questions. Thank you. Any questions from anyone on the board? Ms. Brumpong. <laughs> Thank you. I seem to be having all the questions today. <laughs> I apologize. Um, this is more, um, so this is not directly related to this one, I guess, but more of a comment and something for us to think about. I don't know if it is possible or not. Um, but this particular <clears throat> audit was a criminal background check for, I guess, this is our staff. That works in BCPS, correct? So whether it's teachers, you know, um, people who are not in, in direct contact with children, et cetera. Um, considering, um, I guess, what's had ha what has happened up in in Harford County, do we um, do we do anything as far as that for our students? As far as determining for students, um, so I guess it's just more of a question or a thought. Like, do we do anything with that? With criminal backgrounds for our students. And maybe you guys aren't the right people to ask. I guess I'm just throwing it out there. <clears throat> uh, yes, Ms. Frempong, I'm not sure that we are the uh, correct person or individuals to answer your question. I'm not sure if that would be something related to uh, under Dr. Raquel Jones area. Um, I don't know the answer to your question, but it's certainly something that we could follow up on and get back to you. Ms. Frempong, we will do a um, a training for board for the board members on um, on that particular topic. Uh, Mr. McMillian, I see you have a um, question, uh, statement. Go ahead, Mr. McMillian. Yeah, Ms. Booker Dwyer, last night at the Southeast uh, Area Advisory Council, that was touched upon. You know, are you comfortable sharing a, a briefly a, a, an update on what they shared? Yeah, I mean, it was a great, great presentation. I know it's not on our agenda, um, so I do want us to go into it uh, in way more detail. I think what was done at the um, Area Advisory Council last night was just phenomenal. And this is why parents should attend and people should attend those meetings because um, they went deep into the discipline and um, the the what the school system knows about a student um, based off of age and all of that. So we will make sure that the board members, we will go over that um, and put it as an official agenda topic. Um, so yeah. that will come. And, and wouldn't it be accurate to say that when a, a, my interpretation, and, and it's my interpretation, 
but of what was presented last night. If a student gets arrested out on the street, out in the community, then we, we become notified of that if they're a certain age and above. That's right. generally speaking correct, right, Ms. Booker-Dryer? Yes, that was presented. Okay, thank you. So then I guess as I understand, we'll go into more detail uh, at another time. And um, like I said, this is more of kind of a, I guess, in parallel, it's not specific to this one. But then I guess if that is the case, um, I guess, is that something that we would be able to to look at as far as maybe a future uh, audit or something? I don't know if that would fall under something that we um, could look into. I think we did something along those lines when we did the um, MOU between Baltimore County Public Schools and um, and the police department. And we, I guess, similar to employee information coming into the Department of Human Resources, information related to student arrests and so forth is reported um, was Dr. April Lewis. And I believe Mr. Knox took her position over if I'm recalling correctly, and, and uh, Mr. Edwards, you can maybe help me out with that, but I do believe that that is where that information resides, and that's where the information is reported to. Thank you. Mr. Edwards, do you have anything to add to that? I think you did the SRO audit. No, that is correct. They do compile data. We are notified uh, if a student is arrested. Um, that would be something handled in uh the school safety office. Any other questions on this item? So I do have a question um, about the statement that individuals with adverse criminal backgrounds um, were not hired. And, and I only have a question because um, it, I know members of the public probably have the same question, uh, given, you know, in light of news stories that came out earlier in the year. Um, so could you speak to that a little bit that, you know, I uh, of how we're speak a little bit more into your audit process to ensure that um, that we're that everything is being followed and that we are positively not hiring people with a criminal background. Sure. So the regulations indicate um, very specific um, things that employees cannot do. For example, um, employees cannot have sexual assault types of crimes on their report and or violent crimes. And so we we wanted to make sure um, also in no drug abuse types of crimes specifically for bus drivers and so those are the types of things we wanted to ensure that the office of investigations and records management um, was reviewing with the criminal background check portion and this was this audit only focused on the criminal background um, check that's required before hiring an employee. Thank you. That's, Any other okay. questions? All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Edwards, please proceed with the COBRA audit report. Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Uh, I am Dwayne Edwards. I'm a senior auditor in the Internal Audit Department, and I uh, completed the audit of the uh, the, the COBRA audit. We completed the Office of Employee Benefits, Retirement, and Absence Management COBRA audit on September 9th, and the final audit report has been posted to the Internal Audit's website and is also available on board docs for this meeting. Throughout this presentation, I will review to the I will refer to the Office of Employee Benefits, Retirement and Absence Management as OEB. I would like to thank Ms. Robin Poor, Ms. Mary Shanahan, Ms. Shannon Dawkins from OEB for being here to present 
management corrective action plans and to help answer any questions. The OEB provides BCPS employees and retirements with assistance and solutions to questions regarding benefits, including COBRA. OEB sends COBRA eligibility notices to qualified beneficiaries. COBRA election forms are returned to OEB. And enrollment is recorded in the BCPS Automated Human Resource Records, uh, which is CGI. Election forms are forwarded to VOIA, a third party administrator who collects COBRA insurance premiums and monitors employee or monitors enrollee participation. The objective of our audit was to assess or to assess BCPS compliance with the legal requirements of COBRA benefit administration and the accuracy of COBRA processes to ensure eligible employees and dependents receive the benefits they are entitled to under law. COBRA is part of the Employee Retirement Income Security Act or ERISA for federal COBRA regulations, employers must offer continuation coverage that is identical to the coverage available to active employees under group plans. Before discussing the findings of the report, I wanted to discuss the changing responsibilities of both OEB and VOIA. During fiscal year 25, the responsibility of notifying eligible employees and their dependents of COBRA coverage and communicating COBRA coverage elections with health insurance carriers will shift to VOIA. VOIA will administer all aspects of the COBRA program for BCPS eligible employees and their dependents. At this time, I'd like to discuss the commendations listed in the report. OEB's communications about COBRA on their website, their benefits guide, and written standard operating procedures comply with all applicable federal COBRA requirements. Further, OEB provided timely responses to our uh, request. At this time, I'd also like to thank Ms. Robin uh, Poor for her assistance during the review. Um, she was extremely professional and knowledgeable about COBRA and made our review very, very uh, efficient. And I really appreciate her time and efforts uh, during our audit. Now I will review the two findings in the art report. Finding number one, required COBRA notices were not sent to certain groups of qualified beneficiaries. COBRA eligibility notices were not sent to employees on board leaves, workers' compensation, retirees, and overage dependents of retirees for the period July 1, 2023 through May 31, 2024. This was due to an oversight and changes in personnel. These groups of qualified beneficiaries were excluded from the reporting used by OAB to generate notifications. Our recommendation is that OEB must ensure that all eligible employees and dependents receive COBRA notifications when a qualifying event occurs. This includes keeping accurate records of employee enrollments, qualifying events, and the timing of notification mailings. At this time, Ms. Poor will present the corrective action plan for finding number one. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Good evening, everyone. Um, again, my name is Robin Poor. I'm the HR specialist who worked on this project. Since May of 2024, the Office of Employee Benefits, Retirement and Absence Management partnered closely with our DOIT department to ensure the specific COBRA reporting was created for retirees, overage dependents of retirees, employees on board leaves, <clears throat> and applicable employees on workers' compensation. A COBRA automation project is currently underway to transfer all of the life events that are captured in our Human Resources Information System, otherwise known as HRIS, to send to the COBRA administrator, VOIA, who will fully take over and carry out the task of sending uh, by mail the eligibility notices and completing all related tasks. The tentative transition date is September of 2024, and we are on task to transfer this project within September.
Thank you, Ms. Poor. Now I will review finding number two, October elections for BCPS records do not match FOIA records. A review of COBRA eligibility enrollment data during the audit period indicated differences between COBRA data maintained in CGI and COBRA data maintained by VOIA. This included differences in plan enrollment as well as differences in enrollment periods. These differences were caused by data entry error, lack of reconciliation of COBRA data per BCPS to COBRA data per VOIA, and also the default enrollment period in CGI. Differences of this nature could lead to inaccurate COBRA coverage for qualified beneficiaries and inaccurate health insurance premiums paid by BCPS to its insurance carriers. Please note that all of the differences noted during our review were investigated and corrected by OEB staff. Our recommendation is that OEB should develop a procedure to reconcile COBRA del eligibility data per CGI to COBRA enrollment data maintained by VOIA on a periodic basis. Differences should be investigated and corrected. At this time, Ms. Poor will present the corrective action plan for finding number two. Thank you. The COBRA automation project, which I mentioned earlier, is currently underway to transfer all life events that are captured in our human resources information system, HRIS, to shift COBRA responsibilities to VOIA, who will fully take over all associated tasks. This includes any changes, terminations, or new enrollments. And the tentative transition date was September 2024, and we are on track to transfer um, within the month of September. Thank you, Ms. Poor. Um, and, and thanks again for all of your help during our review. Uh, we could not have done what we did without all of your assistance, and we really do appreciate that. My pleasure. Thank you oh. for being patient. <laughs> um, that concludes our presentation of the COBRA audit report. I will now turn it back over to Ms. Booker Dwyer. Thank you. Are there any questions from committee members? Thank you. So that concludes our audit reports. Thank you all for this, your work on these reports. Um, the next item on the agenda is, um, is audit committee uh, training. And one of the things that I um, talked with Ms. Barr about is to create a training module or we're gonna work on something um, and not just for audit committee members, but for any board member. Um, to, to really fully understand uh, everything that happens in the audit committee. We know that in July, we, we are, we're gonna uh, switch out committee members. There'll be some movement of committee members. And so just in preparation for that, we wanna ensure, and you have your email up on the screen, so we don't wanna see anything that we shouldn't see. Um, and so we wanna ensure that um, everyone is just well prepared and know what they're signing up for when they when they come to the audit committee. So that is something that is on the horizon. Mr. McMillian, yes. Did, did I'm not sure if I heard you correctly. Did you say something about switching out committee members in July? So every July, um, that is when we'll switch committee members. Well, or, wasn't or, that or when or when committee members will have the opportunity or when board members will have the opportunity to say, I want to continue in this committee or I want to switch it out. I was thinking from my previous experience when the new leader, the new chair was voted in in December, that shortly thereafter, those committees would be established. Is would, I'm, 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 that's right. always, I'm not saying that's the right way, but that's the way it's been done. Right. So at the previous, so there was a board meeting a little while ago where we discussed that and um, and it was July. So when we came out with the um, committee assignments um, that it was decided in July that that would occur. I don't remember the exact board meeting date, but that did occur at a board meeting. There was a motion to move that from to July and people voted on that. I, let passed? me check with, let me pull so we can get Tracy to pull the exact language it was in the um there was discussion around it and there was consensus around it so we can get Tracy to pull the exact date for it 
um, when okay. that occurred. That occurred a little while ago, a, a few months ago in the summer, I believe. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so the next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, October 15, 2024 at 4.30 p.m. Um, you all have the list of topics that will be addressed. And so committee members, if you have any questions about the um, topics or anything that you want um, added, just let me know and we'll make sure that it's added. Uh, Ms. Harvey, I see your hand is up. I I'm sorry. To, I, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I appreciate the um, the work of the audit committee. I think it it auditing a system, particularly a system this large, is important. Uh, is important work and is necessary work. I I do have some concerns though about what appears to me to be a conflation of audits and investigations, um, and it's a concern for me because we have a limited amount of resources both in human capital and time uh, and this system is such a large system that um, i feel like we need to be laser focused on those processes system-wide that are impacting our ability to educate young people and provide um, high quality uh, leaders and teachers and reach our goals. So uh, I, I would like to have further conversations about that, particularly if the hotline and if the work of the hotline is to conduct person specific investigations based on a specific allegation uh, or uh, misuse or irregular practice, then I, I, I do believe at first, you know, pass that that should go to uh, the, it, it should go to personnel. I don't think, I, I don't perceive and I have not experienced audit units conducting fraud, waste and abuse um, looking at auditing that for an individual person that's actually an investigation and not an audit and i i just believe that miss barr and her team um could be better used with other system-wide um audit um targets rather than that particular um function that they're serving now and so i just wanted to put that out there and i hope that we can have some further discussion on that and so we, and so Ms. Harvey, um, we can add that discussion to the next, um, the October meeting. And specifically the discussion, it will be about um, focusing the, or opportunities to focus the audit process on the system, why pro procedures and processes and not individuals. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Okay, so Ms. Barr, add that to the October agenda. We will start with that and we'll um, dedicate some time um, for that. Okay, I will. Any other questions or comments? Okay. And so we will see everyone on Tuesday, October 15, 2024 at 4.30 p.m. And um, the audit committee meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone.